you grew up in, in, in rural Lincolnshire. Yes, I did. Uh, the American songbook doesn't come naturally to someone born in, in, in Lincolnshire. What, how, how did you become immersed in it so, so young? Oh my gosh. Well, like anybody else, you know, I mean, I listen to music. It's, uh, I, I, I mean, the first, the first thing I remember was listening to music on the radio. We had a tiny radio from the minute I can remember. And I, I, the things that I was listening to uh, in the beginning on the BBC weren't just blowing my skirt up at all. I mean, it just wasn't happening. Yeah. And then suddenly I, I, I listened to, I, inadvertently somehow I got turned on to country music. And country I mean, I read, I read that in your book, Scattershot. Right. That incredible coincidence almost that the American GI, you had something through the window. But it, it kind of evolved into that. I mean, it's kind of a longer story. You know, I, I'd initially heard uh, the best, uh, what, was, what was the best of country music that was available mm. on English radio at the time, and it was very limited. Mm. Mm. But the few things that came across were, were story songs. Mm. And there were people like Johnny Horton, Marty Robbins, and, and things like that. And those were the things that really instilled an interest in songwriting to me. But you have to remember that I knew nothing about what a song consisted yeah. of. Yeah. It was more about, I, I love what was, I love some of the modern pop records of the time, mm. but they just didn't give me any sort of interest in possibly doing it for myself. It was just ear candy. And when I heard those kind of story songs by people like, as I said, sort of Johnny Horton, North to Alaska, you know, Sink the Bismarck. And then there were people like Marty Robbins. When I heard Marty Robbins' mm. El Paso, I've always said that was like the blue touch paper. It was like story songs. Mm. And that was, and then ultimately, yes, I luckily ran into uh, an American sort of Air Force guy who was stationed cl close by yeah. and happened to yeah. live next to a friend of mine. And from the, he, he opened up a complete treasure trove to me of all these people that, you know, weren't played on the radio in England. I mean, a real country like sort of the Leuven brothers and people like that. And that was sort of just, uh, he opened Pandora's box for me. It was just bang, you know, it's just really, I, I thought, wow, you can tell stories and, you know, put them to music. To music. Yeah. And, and it just evolved from there, and it was just luck of the draw that I was at a loose end, and I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And I thought, when I saw this, the famous ad in the New Musical Express in 1967, um, I just thought, wow, you know, I, I'm going to take a shot at this. And I just started writing a bunch of stuff that was completely formless. Mm -hmm. It had no, I had, no, like I said, I had no idea mm. of how to write a song. Mm. I just, it was just sort of stream of consciousness. And luckily, you know, Kismet has it. Uh, I just met the right guy who knew how to uh, put some, take that apart and yeah. reconstruct it as a song. And he, he also uh, applied for the... For the well, exactly, the but he, he, he had the opposite thing going yeah. for him, you know. He, he had the musical chops, but he had no idea how to write lyrics, or he just didn't know how to do it, or didn't want to do it, and wanted to find a like-minded person. And we came together because of, not just because we com were compatible to each other, but we just had this absolute drive for music, that we just love music, but we love every kind of music. And I love the fact that, you know, on this stage tonight, we've seen different levels of, of how people create music. And it's wonderful to see that. It's just wonderful to see that art sort of transforming, you know, how people think about uh, think about life in general. And do, you, do you remember, because lots of us will have seen, in fact, probably everybody in here would have seen the film Rocket Man. 
right. which you had uh, full creative control over sure. your character. Yeah. Um, and could, but could you describe now what what was it like meeting Reggie that then became Elton John? And can you describe that meeting and 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 and, and, what, and what what it felt like to you? Not yeah. know, you know. Yeah, well, I, I think I just basically answered it in my uh, yeah. in the question before when I said we came together for an app because of an absolute love for music, mm. and I think it's interesting because I think that scene in Rocket Man in the cafe yeah. where. You know, we didn't actually start singing uh, Streets of Laredo, <laughs> but there was, there was that kind of element because I brought to the table this love for country music. And at the time, that, that wasn't thought of as being very hip. You know, I was kind of closeted in my love for country music, you know. And he was totally uh, open for it. He understood what I loved about that kind of music and, and by the same token he turned me on to things like he was very much at that time into American R&B and soul and we for most of that meeting I remember all we talked about was music and our love for music and I, I again I, it's funny earlier tonight that young lady that said you know uh, there was a silence and imagine a world without music. I, I, I subscribe to that 100% because everything that Elton and I have done in the last 55 years has all been based on a love for all kinds of music, a tolerance for all kinds of music. I probably don't play every kind of music all day, but that's always been the driving force. And I think that kind of rolls over into what this is all about Absolutely. tonight. Absolutely, and, and you, you started, you started your career as a, as a you, you and Elton as, 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 as staff songwriters, as a, which, which, you know, many songwriters in this room will be going from session to session, writing songs, pitching songs for other artists. Um, and I want to bring things back down to earth for just a second <laughs> because you're in the UK now, Bernie. But um, uh, as, as a coincidence would have it, um, uh, in, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but in, in, in 1968, uh, you and Elton pitched a song for the Eurovision Song Contest for Lulu uh, to sing. Um, unfortunately, Lulu chose another song. Um, however, there are also two people in this room who also separately wrote songs. Okay. <laughs> Is Don Black here? Yes. <laughs> Okay, I got to. I, I can't see anybody. So, Don, if you're here, hi. But I have to say, where are you? <laughs> hey. Okay, I gotta say, when Elton and I first signed with Dick James, we were told to write songs like Don Black, <laughs> and we never could. And that's why we moved on to another genre. But God bless you, Don. <laughs> well. It, it wasn't only you guys that, can, that didn't get the cut. Well, Don also that year couldn't get the cut. And my dad, Angelo Weber, also pitched a song and it also didn't get used. <laughs> okay. We should start a club. So, yeah. <laughs> and you, you guys lost to a song called Boom Bang A Bang. So there we go. I remember that, yes. Anyway, now on to some, uh, some, of, your, some of your successes. But your song. Right. Did that set the tone for your writing? Process? Absolutely, yeah. Up to that point, uh, again, you know, when you're struggling as a songwriter, you know, you've got to have supreme confidence in what you do. And you start out by emulating your heroes or what is currently in vogue. And that's what we were doing. And um, at, at that particular point in time, it, everything that was sort of in vogue was basically psychedelic. You know, we were trying to emulate people like Procol Harum and Cream and Pink Floyd. And that, it, it, just, it just sounded like a pastiche of everything else. And the thing about writing songs, and I, I bring this into it because I think it's important tonight, You've got to find an original voice. 
You know, you've got to have supreme confidence in what you do, but you have to find an original voice. You can, you can emulate your heroes for so long, but they're doing it better than you. You have to find something original to say. And the first thing that we wrote that had a sort of original, what we thought was original, and it actually worked, was a song called Skyline Pigeon. And um, it's funny because it's, we wrote it and got two covers on it in the first couple of weeks. And at that point in time, Elton wasn't recording himself. We were still sort of jobbing songwriters. But then um, that gave us really a, a, a moral boost. And um, then, yes, it just, your song just appeared like that. And it happened very much the way it did in the movie. I mean, it was sort of written on the spur of the moment. We didn't really, we weren't sure of what it was going to be, but Elton literally took it. And the minute that, you know, he sat down and played those, the sort of immortal chords, we knew we'd got something special. And, and you, you wrote so much music in such a short space of time, sometimes two albums a year. I mean, how, how, how did it work? Did Elton call you to say, uh, Bernie, I want to make a record. Have you got any uh, stories for me? Or did you have them in your back pocket? Well, we, were, all, we were in the same place all the time in, in, those, in, the days, in those days, days, you know. So, yes, I mean, it was ridiculous. But everybody was doing that in yeah. the late 60s and 70s. You, you were contracted to do two albums a year. And mm, so, at the time, it really didn't seem like a lot because it was... So it was done on time rather than the amount of albums? Well, the, that's all we did at the time, you yeah. know. We hadn't developed as, yeah. as human beings, basically. Mm. All we knew was writing songs together. We, that's all we did every day. Mm. You know, we'd get up and right now, you know, we write a song every sort of seven months. <laughs> you know, <that's laughs> like, but, but back then, yes, I mean, we, that's all we had to do, you know. So we would write songs, we'd go on the road, we'd come back, we'd write songs, make an album. We were writing constantly, constantly. But I think that was, you know, de rigueur for the day, you know, that's what we did back then. And you, and so you go to Elton with a, a, a song title or with, 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 with a whole song? I mean, how well, did it? Yeah, with the complete lyric, I mean, yeah. but... but you know, it's a divided thing. I mean, as far as my writing style, yes, one of the things that I'm known for is probably coming up with titles yeah. first, mm. and then I'll be, but, but again, you know, it's, I, I'm an observer, yeah. and, and the world is, you know, the world is my sort of, I'm a, cin a cinematographer of, of things that I see around me, people that I run into, situations mm. that I encounter, and that's, that's where you get that originality from, yeah. you know. I think that's what anybody out there who's, who's trying to make it as a songwriter, you've got to... It's funny because I was listening to uh, an interview on a jazz station that I listened to the other day, and there was an interview with the great jazz bassist Stanley Clark. And it was a Q and A with him, and somebody asked him, "Well, how do how do I make it?" <laughs> he said, "Well, you got to be really, really good." <laughs> and I thought, "Well, that's really kind of brutal, but it's absolutely true." <laughs> but I think that comes from having an original idea. Yeah. You've got to have an original idea. It was like the young kid that was on tonight, uh, the guitar player, the Sam Wilkinson. Yes! Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. I mean, because. He had, he had so much elements of an, of an old voice with such a young voice and original things to say. I mean, there's so much talent on here tonight, you know. I mean, how good is Jacob Lusk? Oh. The guy is brilliant. I mean, absolutely yeah. extraordinary. But, and there's so much great talent. But that kid, you know, I mean, that to me mm. was a you know, an original idea. It just... That's, that's what I'm talking about. Wow, yeah, Sam is, is, is incredible. And he's 18 years old. You know? Yeah, I, uh, that's amazing. amazing. I mean, I wish I'd been that good at 18 years old, <laughs> you know? Well, I, think, I think you were. Um, I, I, I was on the move. And th th you're, so, many of, um, so many of your songs, I mean, take um, I'm Still Standing, for example. That, 
feels like, I mean, it felt like, um, you know, it's coming from Elton, it's all about his life and, and what's happening there, but no, no, I read it wasn't. That was written as a kiss off to an old girlfriend. <laughs> and I'm happy to say that it, it's over the years has taken on new meaning as sort of like a, 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 El, a sort of Elton's comeback, a sort of voice of defiance, I'm still here. And that makes much, much more sense yeah. to me now. You know, you can't go back and rewrite your history. And, you know, unfor unfortunately, the person that was originally written about is one of my very best friends now. So it's, it all worked out, but I'm much, I'm much happier thinking it's a song about Elton. And when you have a, when you, when you deliver a lyric like Rocket Man, for example, that's fictitious, mm -hmm. do you have to explain to Elton what you're trying to... No, no, I've never done that. I mean, it, it's got to the point where... They, I, the song, I'm not sure what it was. It, I can't remember now, but I remember a song that we'd written oh, back in the early 70s. And I remember in the mid 70s, him performing the song on stage and walking off. And as he walked off, he just said to me, I just realized what that song's about. <laughs> and <laughs> so that's kind of it in a nutshell, you know. The, he never. He's more interested about if he puts something on his piano and goes, he, he'll look through things that I've given him. You know, I, if, when, we've, when we've done a particular album, you know, I'll give him maybe 20 lyrics and he'll put them on the piano and just shuffle through them and he'll see a title. And if it, it, it's what he feels like, that particular moment of that particular day. And he'll just go, maybe start in the middle of the song, you know, and find, f find like a, um, a line that appeals to him. And he'll start working from there. Because Saturday night, for example, that, that's, that's got to be upbeat. I mean, it's, well, it's, uh, yes, you know. it's, it's always, I mean, there's a certain dictation in, in the lyrics themselves. Because if you write a Saturday night, yeah. it's all right for fighting. It's not going to be a ballad. Sorry seems to be the and, hardest and, word. And, and, and don't let the sun go down. I mean, yeah. you see that lyric, he's not going to turn that into a 12-bar blues. You know? So, um, <laughs> in, in a way, you know, the lyrics do dictate a sort of what they should be melodically. And when you're writing the words, do you use music in some way when you write them or you just... That, that's kind of evolved over time. I mean, now when, if, well, not now, but for the last couple of decades, the last three decades, when I write lyrics, I use a guitar. But it's almost become like, a, I always say it's like Linus's security blanket. You know, I, I need it there. Yeah. And, you know, it's like three chords and the truth. You know, I can play a couple of chords. But it's not about that, it just gives me a sort of sense of mm. meter, a sense of melodic structure, you know. Like I said earlier, back in the early days, I, I had no idea what it was to write a song. I was, as I said, I was flying by the seat of my pants. But, but now, or, or in the past decades, I've become more musically proficient. I know how, you know, and I've got older. So you, you learn more as you grow older. And do you, you don't reveal those chords to Elton, you just use it as a way to, to come up with the words and then you send the words as they are? Yeah, or... I mean, it's, it's a bit of a sort of urban myth the way that we write. Yes, we write separately, but it's not this whole thing about, you know, I mailed, you know, that happened maybe <laughs> way back in the early... But back then, we were together all the time. Yeah. And, and, and now, and again in the past few decades, we're always together in the studio, so I come loaded for bear, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I bring my product with me, yeah. and he, he, he's changed over the decades. There's, he's gone through periods of time where he likes to write immediately in the studio. He doesn't want to do anything beforehand. He likes to sit in the studio in his sort of con controlled environment and write. Mm -hmm. And so, it's not as anemic and sort of um, plastic as it appears. Mm. You know, there's a, there's a lot of unity. There's a lot yeah, of me, of you know, I, I will explain things to him. Not, not necessarily what the song is about, 
but about maybe the possible feel for it. You know, I'll say, well, maybe this has got a little kind of soulful role to it. It's a bit Ray Charles, it's a bit this. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more of uh, this than I think people imagine. And take Indian Sunset, for example, where Eminem sampled it for Tupac's Ghetto Gospel. Right. And then more recently, obviously, you've had the Dua Lipa Canal record, which, which has four songs in it. Right. How, how do you feel hearing your words jumbled up in random? Oh, I love things? it. I love it. I'm not precious about what I write at all. You know, I mean, I let Joni Mitchell rewrite I'm Still Standing <laughs> at the uh, Gershwin, Gershwin Prize Awards just recently, and I loved it. Yeah. So, um, no, I'm not, I'm not fussy about that. And I love the fact that, you know, our songs and our music, it keeps getting reimagined as the decades progress and I love it you know I love the fact that uh, kids out there can do certain things with our songs and I believe that great songs don't die they just keep going that's why the American songbook you know it's it's never going to fade away I completely agree and actually so for all the songwriters and producers and artists in here Bernie says you can use it <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so what's, what's next for you? Well, Elton and I have an album coming out very soon, but I can't say anything about it because I'm under strict orders to be still. Um, but yes, there's music in the pipeline. It's all done. It's all recorded. It's, I think it's quite brilliant and uh, it's very contemporary. And I think it will certainly surprise a lot of people and hopefully excite a lot of people and hopefully be successful. <laughs> well, we, we can't wait to all hear it. Um, Bernie, thank you so oh, thank much. You, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, we are so thrilled and honoured to have you here. Thank you so much. Wow.